inviting me along today. Um, as you'll probably be, be told, my name's Adam Briggs. I'm the Environment and Land Use Advisor for the National Farmers Union in the North West. Just to talk a little bit about what the NFU are, just so you know who's talking to you, we are a, essentially a trade association um, and we lobby on behalf of farmers, commercial farmers across the country. Uh, we're not affiliated to any one particular party, essentially we're politically neutral, um, but my job really is to deal with problems that farmers come up with on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to try and lobby to provide the best possible um, environment for our members to do business. My role is really focused on the environment um, side of things. Now, today what I decided to do was just to give you a flavour of this issue from very much a commercial. Can you all see this map? No. Oh. No. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this isn't this isn't as good as a. Uh, this isn't as good, but essentially what this is, so obviously Lancaster's there in the middle. The first thing I wanted to say is that the ability to produce food in an area is very, very dependent on the sort of land you have. And this is Lancaster area. And essentially what this shows here is that there are different sort of grades of land. Your brown land is essentially your grade five land. That is essentially, it's not suitable for anything else other than rough grazing. Your yellow land is your grade four land. That is essential, not suitable for anything other than slightly better grazing. This green land here is what they call grade three land. That is suitable by and large for producing better quality grass. And this here, down in the bottom, um, which is like the bluey sort of colour, that's a grade two land. That is essentially suitable for producing very good quality grass and potentially some vegetables. What I would say about Lancaster is, by and large, the majority of farmers in this area will produce and grass simply because the land will not let them produce anything else. On a commercial basis, that essentially is what their land is uh, suitable for. There's currently 46,000 hectares of agricultural land in Lancaster and district. Of that, um, 44,000 is grass. And the reason behind that is because that is what the land is suitable for. And that kind of underpins on a commercial basis everything you can do with your land if you want to tackle climate change and if you want to produce food. Do you want to unshare your screen now, Pete? So in terms of moving forward, that obviously means that, you know, as a country, you know, if we want to move towards a plant-based diet, which is where this, uh, this debate often goes, we need to understand that by and large in terms of food producing, 60% of our land isn't suitable for doing that. So actually you've got some challenges on that better land, such as down in West Lancashire, where potentially you can produce food. Uh, the other thing to remember as well is that different grades of land uh, different grades of uh, plant food are only suitable for livestock and some different grades of plant food some are suitable um, for eating food. So just because you can grow cereals in this part of the world doesn't mean it's necessarily um, suitable for people to eat. Um, moving forward in relation to tackling climate change, which is kind of what uh, we're all on this call for, Agriculture obviously accounts for 10% of um, greenhouse gases and the NFU set itself uh, an ambition for the industry to be carbon neutral by 2040. That doesn't mean producing no greenhouse gases, that means reducing the ones we do produce down and doing something on our farms to suck in the, um, uh, the, the, the other greenhouse gases we produce. There are three ways we're looking at doing that. The first one is just to massively increase the efficiency of what we do. That's increasing things like yield per cow. So you need less um, land and, and less forage to get the same amount of milk. Uh, better management, that's reducing things like soil compaction because that will then um, help with um, the fertility of the land. And there's other things potentially, I think biotechnology has a role to play in this and that's just potentially looking at things like GM. Uh, interesting is a farm not far from here because you've probably GM? heard Sorry, um, oh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> uh, it's uh, genetic modification, so it's a GM crop. So if you could design a crop that would need less energy to produce the same yield, surely in climate change um, perspective, that's quite a good thing. So that's, again, something potentially uh, you could look at. Uh, you've probably heard quite a bit about methane in relation to livestock farming. Again, there's a farm not far from here in Hornby who's feeding a, an additive to his cows that's reduced methane emissions down by 30% just by feeding a natural additive which consists of garlic and, um, and essentially lemon juice. So there are some technological things we can actually embrace which might then massively reduce the amount of greenhouse gases um, we produce. Um, the other part of that is look at things we can do on our farm which will suck in carbon. That's better grassland management, more trees, more hedges, things like that. And then the third the plan is to use our land to produce energy as well as food. So things like solar farms, that sort of thing, things like wind farms as well. 
And the overall strap line for this, because we've got a challenge where we need to keep producing uh, enough food to feed the planet, is that we need to produce more and impact less. So keep on producing what we produce, but produce the impact we have while we do that. So moving forward in terms of challenges and opportunities and, and around all this, this agenda, um, I think the key thing with all of this is that you identify actions which are winners right across the board. Actions which deliver for farm um, productivity, actions which deliver for the environment, and actions which deliver for biodiversity. If we focus on those three areas, we'll then hopefully get to a situation whereby you know it's good for farmers, it's good for the environment, and, and everybody's happy. To achieve that, we need to move the debate away from where it is now. If you're a farmer, every time um, climate change gets mentioned, essentially all you think is that they want me to stop producing food and they're blaming me for everything. What we need to do is get out of our trenches and start talking to each other and th stop throwing avocados and, and, and uh, almonds and lamb chops and cheese at each other. Actually get out and have a proper conversation with each other about how we tackle this issue. When I talk to farmers, I say you need to accept that your lamb and your beef can never be carbon neutral. Where you produce lamb, beef, or any sort of food, you will always have a greenhouse gas footprint. What you need to do is make sure that your farm itself is as carbon neutral as it possibly can be. So while you're producing greenhouse gases, do other actions on your farm, which then suck them in. And again, that could be through planting trees, improving biodiversity, that sort of thing. And that message will land um, very, very well with farmers, especially if there's a commercial benefit to it as well. Uh, we also need to avoid export and production. So we're going to, going, we need to get to a situation whereby, you know, we might massively reduce production down here and go carbon neutral here, but all of a sudden we're importing a lot more from abroad, whereby their um, their carbon footprint, their practices are worse than ours. Um, and then we need to consider the knock-on effects of decisions we make here. If in Lancaster we said we want to advocate moving to a plant-based diet, you'll export, certainly in the UK, production to those areas which um, have some huge challenges of their own, particularly in relation to peatland areas. The majority of our land which, which is um, capable of producing uh, vegetables and high value horticultural crops is very, very prone to water stress and, and flooding. So we need to consider, we make one decision here because I think it's a good thing, what is a knock-on effect? of everything we do in terms of potentially increasing pressures on those areas of peatland which are already under pressure and there's some, there's some other challenges they face as well. We don't need to just consider one decision in, a, in isolation, consider everything in its entirety. And I think that in terms of the role uh, of Lancaster City Council, you know, if you were to say what could Lancaster City Council do, I think number of things they could do. The first one would be just make sure the regulatory framework with things they control is fit for purpose and actually supports farmers and things they want to do, particularly around diversification and alternative energy. Um, focus on the win-wins, so focus on those things that deliver for farmers and the environment and for climate change as well. Base your decisions on the right information. Don't use international figures to influence your decisions here. Base them on the, the, you know, the, the production standards in the UK or the production standards in Lancaster itself. Fully carbon cost decisions, so take into account the knock-on effect of what would happen if you said we're gonna do X, what would be um, the, uh, the impact on Y. And just be aware of the unintended consequences of what you do. So again, that goes back to thinking about thinking through fully the decisions to think if I did decide to advocate this, what is the knock on effect elsewhere in the country and also uh, elsewhere in the world. And probably the final one is if you want to engage positively with farmers is recognize that they see themselves as food producers first and foremost. And anything you do, which is going to, which is going to uh, engage them needs to be complementary to their business and something they want to engage with in a positive way. And if you, if you sell it along those sorts of lines, everybody just gets out their trenches and starts engaging in a positive way. I think you'll, we'll, we'll make some progress rather than where are we, where we are now, which essentially is just kind of complete loggerheads with each other in relation to this. And that's me.